for this podcast. We're proud to partner with Zurich Life and Investments. As one of the last true independent life insurers, Zurich has always believed in the value of advice and the professionals who provide it. They continue to invest in programs such as this one that are designed to strengthen the health and reputation of the advice profession. They're excited about the chance to partner with us, XY Advisor, to help shape the future direction of advice and help make it more accessible to more Australians. To find out more or to check out some of the latest advisor support tools, visit the website or ask your Zurich BDM. G'day, g'day. How's it going? What do you know? Strike a light. Adam Turk, what's happening, my man? Hello, boys. Thanks very much for having me today. Ah, You're uh, very welcome. You're someone that's uh, somehow... Uh, infiltrated the XY world, and I can't quite figure out how it happened. I think Ray Jaramus is to blame initially. Is yeah, I think it was. So it's, um, I think Ray got hold of me on LinkedIn mm. from with a question about uh, UK pensions, actually. Right. And uh, we got talking up there and then had a coffee, as you do, and he was... Uh, basically said at some stage, but this was like six, nine months ago, maybe. Right. And he said, yeah, should come along and get involved with XY and do a podcast and we're finally here. <laughs> <laughs> takes a while, takes a while. Um, right, so you moved to Australia 11, 10, 10 11 years yeah, ago. Yeah, 11 years ago now, so yeah, I'm in right. that twilight zone. <laughs> like, you know, Aussie English, if I, if I go back home... People think I sound Aussie. Hey, really? Yeah, yeah, so you yeah, just yeah, get yeah, shit yeah, yeah, yeah. on I either side of it. Exactly, exactly, <laughs> exactly, exactly. And amongst all my mates over here, and you know, I've really got no English mates over here, so I'm the token pom ah. amongst everyone. It's just too <laughs> but, uh, easy, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's quite. It's good bad. It's good bad. <laughs> it's uh, good fun. Good fun. But. And uh, and you you were brought over here with one could uh, argue greener pastures for both uh, relationship and sailing is that, that's correct um yeah well two loves in life really one sailing the other one i won't mention um <laughs> <laughs> No, I don't think the wife will listen to this one. She? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, yeah, I've been sailing all my life since I was three years old. And uh, yeah, Sydney's one of the great places to sail. Mm. Um, ultimately, I chased a, a girl over here, as you, as you do, um, <laughs> who's now my wife. Uh, and uh, yeah, so like we've, I've been coming over here uh, for about four or five years before we moved over here. And... Uh, I couldn't really put up a good argument not to move here, really. (laughs) Uh, Ultimately, I think Cecilia tells the story that it'd been three weeks in London and it was winter and she hadn't seen the sun in three (laughs) weeks because it'd just been like, like, uh, I don't know how much time you spend in England, but it can be just overcast for weeks on end and like, you know, especially in winter. Winter's, you know, quite short daylight hours anyway. Mm. And she was just suffering from the old... Yeah, I think it's called sad, isn't it? Seasonal order, <laughs> yeah, affected disorder or yeah, something. Yeah. And she was just like, oh, I really want to go home to Sydney. And, uh, and yeah, just professionally and in life, it was a, yeah, a good time to go. Mm. And, uh, yeah, difficult not to argue with the place. Hey? It's a, it's a weather's good. Uh, um, you know, scenery's stunning. Yeah. Beaches are good. Yeah. No, we've, we've got it yeah. um, amazing. And, and obviously, financial services is a pretty strong... <clears throat> excuse me industry yes uh, here as well so yeah. and then if you go back far enough you were a financial planner in the uk i was i was yeah i was a financial planner back in the day uh for five six years actually mm. um so that was my real first uh, or effectively what was a financial planner it was uh yeah before or, or, or quite all the way i think we called we were financial consultants right then was the way it, mm-hmm. okay. which basically because we could uh, can sell could only sell certain products right. it was selling then right let's right. not let's not pretend <laughs> this is this is early 2000s right yeah, 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 yeah. what were you selling um back then it was uh everyone needs an insurance don't they and uh you know all those sort of things and yep. uh, look, i can remember i do, yeah i don't, I don't uh, probably not much different in age to you guys but i can remember uh, uh you know, right at the back end of fairly high commission products shall we say so you signed someone up to a a mips which was called a medium term investment savings plan anyway like and it, this went on for 10 years and uh they were quite heavily upfronted with comms so you'd get like a year and a half of 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 premiums 
as an upfront commission for a 10 year saving plan, right? Yeah, right. And, like, and, so and so was that's, how a, the, that's how the industry worked. So, so it wasn't even a lifetime. Was no, 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 no. So it was a so, locked so, in period, a locked no, in you'd 10 get, years? You, you'd get upfront and then, uh, then you'd get clawed back if you. Oh, okay. So, so the people, uh, uh, the, stuff, the client's money wasn't locked in there for 10 years? No, it was locked in there for 10 years. Oh, it was? So, yeah, yeah. So clients have money. They could break it, but they were quite heavy penalties. Okay, so it's almost like a whole, like a 10 year whole of life bond or something. Like, yeah, like a term yeah, whole of life sort yeah, of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and so those were sort of uh, yeah, really big in the 90s and, and mm. things. And, uh, and you know, you, you had huge sales forces back then. Where there was a, uh, I've forgotten the name of the company. I think Liberty is not, no, no, no. I can't remember, but a big American uh, um, insurance company yep. in London. And it wasn't the only one. And they like had you know, a sales force of 2,000 people just selling these products effectively yeah yeah i'm pretty uh, sure that was pretty uh, common uh, um, yeah all over the world yeah, yeah exactly exactly so so i joined right at the end of that period i suppose where everything was very commissions based i think it's fair to say uh, uh, and moved into the, more of the well asset management side of things well no i just talking about the industry more into the sort of client focused shall we say side, right. side of things that is now yes Oh, you mean asking what like what, what people, people wanted, wanted to achieve? Well, what they actually want? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Wait a exactly. second. What, what do you think? Yeah, Wait well, a <laughs> second. <laughs> Are you a consultant or not? <laughs> Jeez, that would have the comms so, would have gone down on that one. Jeez. <laughs> well, let's be honest. They it all changes, right? It <laughs> does. Like, Over- yeah, you know, there were uh, yeah. The industry's evolves. I don't, I don't think anything. Everything always changes. People, the charges just evolve into different ways and different forms, and certainly cleaner forms now and up front, and everyone knows where they are. Mm. Um, whether they're any worse or better for the client, who yeah, knows? it's, but, it's, but it's it a hard question to answer. Isn't certainly it? more transparent. Let's be honest. Yeah, yes, that's the, that's the key thing. Is this, yeah, you know, it is. I, don't, I think that's what you, that's what you want, right? And that's yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, financial services serves an awesome purpose in people's lives, and there are products that are required in order to implement those strategies and services. And people need to get paid along the way, and and uh, profit driven companies are providing them. And I mean, uh, like we can, you can certainly dive into it too far. Uh, at the end of the day, I I don't really particularly have uh, much of a problem with how, how things are. How, yeah, how I'm a little bit, uh, I agree with you. I'm a little bit worried, uh, like the way we're going to continually evolve. And I think with the Royal Commission and what's going on now, um, what we don't want to see is people alienated from being able to go and a hundred percent services I, and i think that's a problem we're gonna face increasingly definitely uh, is ultimately it's going to be fairly unaffordable for a lot of people it already is i think who need it um whether the digital advice will take over more and whether you know yeah that will work who knows yeah uh, uh, um and you know but the problem with the digital advice is right now it's Pretty much a cookie cutter. Approach, oh, a hundred percent. And I've uh, sat in, um, I've sat in know, meetings and had ASIC say, "We don't want, cookie we don't cutter. want like, cookie like, cutter, like, right?" Like, well, you've, and yeah. then you're pushing everyone into it. Yeah. So, so there's a conflict, and and uh, and hopefully, my 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 desire for what comes out of the royal commission is that we all sit there and go, "Okay, this thing has been under an absolute." magnifying glass now for a long time can we all accept that uh the world isn't perfect and if we if we can reduce the 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 bad eggs right if we can reduce that the whole uh, the industry as 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 it works as itself um uh, sorry as a whole is pretty damn good it's pretty pretty damn good and and there are bad eggs and yeah we should get rid of them right I think we've got to have a, a layered approach, right? I think we've got to have uh, if you're if you're going to see an independent financial advisor, uh, the, the sort of uh, you know that's going to look after you holistically, and it, you know even that's a dodgy subject now, right? <coughs> but it's going yeah. to look after you, uh, you, you know, for your individual needs. Then, then you know that's one thing, and then we need something that's very clear that isn't that kind of approach, that is a limited approach. That will set you up with the best. Yeah, yeah. You need some. We'll, we'll give you a basic idea of the type of things that you you need, and those may be in-house products. But if they, as long as it's very clear what people are getting up front, and then they can then they can choose which way 
they need to go mm. uh, yeah because i'm just how you make it accessible for those people that need it but yeah it's it's it, thing right? it's yeah. things like the best interest duty which is so vague oh, right don't, it's don't so get me started. it's so vague that um so what other industries in reality live under a best interest duty because it sounds amazing right it sounds amazing but let's let's examine this for a moment imagine if food let's imagine food had a best interest duty and so that when you walked into a supermarket it only had say one or two types of milk for example at the top of my head right and then uh and then you got to the end of the aisle of milk and it said these are all the types of milk that we considered but we found that it wasn't in your best interest to drink this type of milk or what happens if it was with cars and you go to a car yard and you've got every make of car there and then you say oh oh, it's in your best interest to have this particular Ford, and and we can't offer. You. These are all the other models, though, that you could have had, but we can't allow you to have yeah. them. I'd flip that around, though, because the best interests. I agree with that, and it's very difficult or impossible to prove. Is it or isn't it in the client's best interest? It's just it's a crazy that, hurdle. Well, a lot, the best, a lot of things, the yeah. best. Well, my my background, as you know, now is more than the investment side and yes. the management side now. You don't know what the best thing is, and that's a hindsight play, right? You're not going to know until three, five. And years how do you measure and best? Gonna, and, you, and how do you measure? Is it and lowest fees? Know, and who knows? Is it highest? Is it highest highest returns? Is it the fact that uh, Host Plus Super, if you look at the PDS on their My Super Balance uh, yeah, product, yeah, yeah, yeah. is around eighty five, yeah, ninety like percent, yeah, ninety yeah, yeah. percent growth assets, right? So you got the Host Plus balanced with ninety percent growth assets. Well, no, because you know infrastructure and of course like is that, yeah, and there. alternatives yeah, and property, yeah, yeah. yeah. and, and uh, yeah. PC, I think, uh, yeah. <laughs> no, <laughs> so I, I think, think it's true. I think alternatives were under, a, were under a, like you know, mate. It, it it's insane. Like you know, so how do you judge it? Do you judge it by this broad term of what it says balanced, and then you can put whatever the hell you want in it, and then oh, See, for the year that's had growth, which is what four out of seven years, you're going to win number one product. So, oh come on. See, I think there's a, a flip side to it though. We know what, and we all know the rights and, and wrongs. And we know what clearly isn't in the client's best interest, right? And it's pretty Absolutely. obvious what isn't in the client's yes. best interest, right? Yes. And it's those things we need to stamp down now and get rid of the industry. And it's those things Correct. that are causing all the damage to Correct. the industry right now, right? But ASIC already has the rules in place. I know. Right? It's already there. If you're not going to enforce what is already available to you and you're it doesn't matter if you make new stuff up does it i know like just do the job and enforce what's already there and all the things that are clearly not in the client's interest like yes charging dead people and all that sort of stuff whoa whoa right? whoa <laughs> yeah, i see dead people <laughs> uh, um, but yeah that stuff doesn't yeah yeah we have to, it's 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 actually an enforcement issue Right? It's yeah. not, it's, it's yep, not yep, yep. anything else. It's an enforcement issue. Yes. Um, so, and, I'm, and we're not having to go at, at ASIC themselves. They, 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 no. they live under their budget and they've yeah. got restraints that naturally come with a reduced uh, budget. So it's not even that they're doing a bad job. But you're right. It, it, it's like, okay, what new rules do you want? Yeah. It's, uh, you know, we've got them all. Yeah. If they're enforced properly. But th- th- H- how you enforce them and, and the whereabouts of that, that's a different argument, right? Well, he- and I'm sure someone from ASIC would put a brilliant... Well, so I was thinking, what what are your thoughts on licensing and the structure of that going forward? Look, it's a little bit out of my knowledge zone. Uh, I, um, I deal with, uh, I sit as RM on a fairly big license, but from in a managed accounts gotcha. sense. Yep. Plus, you're not self-licensed then? Uh, no, no, but are they set as RM on the license that I'm yeah, licensed yeah. under, right? Yep, so, yep, yep, yep. Yeah. So essentially. Really just said, yeah, oh, you're yeah. the RM? Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You're yeah, pretty yeah. much licensed. Yeah, so, yeah, so. Yeah. So, so, yeah, <laughs> involved in yeah, pretty much everything that's going on. In, All the fun in, stuff? In, in the managed managed account space as opposed to... Yeah, so a limited, to, small scope of... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we don't operate uh, outside of that space, obviously. Um, again, how broken is the license model do we actually think i think from a if you're a vertically integrated product seller let's call them sellers not providers 
right? Oh, and that's you, a, that's a yeah, bit harsh. Yeah, it's a bit a bit harsh, but anyway, we're, we're here to be, you know, <laughs> a bit controversial. Uh, uh, um, you know, if you've got a vertically integrated that, and then you've got a sales force underneath, let's call them advisors. Us, yeah, we should should do, but effectively they've got them because it's a sales force, right? Mm. Like historically, that, that is broken, right? That is broken. Oh, like, I mean, they can uh, make uh, it work. Uh, oh, Fofa, well. Fofa came in, right? Yeah. Now, it may cause issues for, say, the parent AMP, but the advisors, the advisors under AMP, I wouldn't call them sellers. I wouldn't. And I'm not saying, I'm just saying on that, AMP see them as sellers for sure. AM, like, that's the reason okay. they did it, right? Fair, that's not like, yes. you know, we're talking yes, about. I'll, the, ag- I'll agree to philosophically, that. Philosophically, we're not talking about the individuals, we're talking physical. Yeah. Sure, sure. From There's AMP's point of view. Right? There's a conflict of intent, you might say. Yes. Conflict of intent, perhaps, but because each invi- individual on the ground is making their own individual decisions under a FOFA environment. I mean, there, there would be AMP uh, uh, advisors out there that don't touch AMP product. Increasingly. Uh, yeah. Now, yes. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, oh, in, in recent right. times. <laughs> well, like, uh, okay. It, no, but it's even, moved that way, but let's go, let's not, you know, five years ago, hell no. Sure, 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 you know, sure. Yeah, yeah, that, that's not, yeah, but it's gonna, and that's going to be more. I think from a licensing point of view, I think the smaller groups, deal, I, I, I don't see how everyone can really go, there's a lot of, movement towards the individual every all individuals becoming licensed yes well asic can't even like um, how, how do you yeah enforce yeah that? yeah like, a- asic, like, asic will do something to reduce like, that for sure yeah how would that like, like work so asic is now responsible for monitoring every individual person and, and everyone yeah and I, I think a lot of people don't understand who who aren't uh, self-licensed is all the processes and everything you've got to have behind the scenes right and everything mm. there and like everyone's going to be no i don't i don't see that that's like yeah. viable right? I, I think things uh, like um, the wealth network dean holmes where he's got 10 you know or he's working his way to 10 companies in the one license yeah and i think that works and i think that that sort of smaller dealer group that have you know 10, 20, 30, 40, you, know, uh, uh, you start to need to put systems and processes in place, I think, to manage uh, over that. Because one of the things, yeah. as a dealer group, you've got to go and monitor these people. You've got to physically go and see all these people, right? And do it fairly yeah. regularly. It's not good enough to go once a year, like, oh, I'm collecting my fees and, like, you know, leave you to it. It's all yes. got to be monitored, right? So, so, um, but, uh, uh, yeah, I see nothing wrong with those uh, uh, um, setups. And I can't see, uh, yeah, there's clearly always going to be bad eggs, if you like. There's always going to be, it's yeah. always going to happen, yeah. Uh, and in any industry, you can't. No, correct. It. How many people have done SEO, right, uh, that that hasn't worked out? Like, we've we found some good people, but we've used some pretty average people. Correct. You want to talk to me about fee for no charges? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> fee for no <laughs> service. <laughs> like, no return. No, like, yeah, exactly. It's like, you know, I'm pretty sure you haven't changed our... Uh, Ranking? Our, our, our words or keywords or, or whatever in the whole time we've been paying you. So, like, Absolutely. You know, anyway, I'm just saying it's everywhere. We've got to get, we, I think we have to get a balance in... You know, you know, the, yeah, the, and I, I think I think what's happened, from my understanding of, of what happened with AMP, it was less to do with the fact that they incorrectly charged and rebated. It's an important part of that story, is they they realised that they had charged this fee for no service and and then rebated the money. That that happened. If if anyone watched the Four Corners um, expose, <clears throat> sorry on. Um, on AMP, that 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 came out, and they, but it it appears that the issue was around the cover up of it happening yeah, at all. Yeah, yeah. and so th- th- I'm sure that they've improved their systems and processes. And before they even got called out on it, they refunded the money. So it was, it, I guess, it was what they'd done to try and yeah pretend like yeah. it didn't happen. You know, yeah. and and. Uh, it's it's one of those things, you know. We're living in a changing environment. And AMP is a big old company, and it's got many things that they need to, you know. Like, and I, I'm not excusing it, but what I am saying is, it's does it deserve to destroy all the trust of the entire financial advice industry and financial services uh, as a whole? I, I don't think it will. Look, I, no, think, I hope not. I know it, it won't. I think people are too. I think generally. Mm. Look, 2008 already did a lot of damage. 
So if people were operating, yeah, if people were operating in the market in uh, yeah before two thousand and eight and uh, and afterwards, and I think if you look at timing of SMSF, the sort of explosion in it and things, a lot of that happened after two thousand and eight or, or the, the and I think that was a rejection of the big banks and and what had happened during the GFC time. So uh, look, I think we've been through a similar bad period from from the point of view or, or, or of reputation i suppose yeah uh, um, and i think most people know that the the advisors who have their client bases and have the relationship with their with their clients they've bought the advisor already correct right you know it's it's i, I don't think there's any danger there and if it turns away people from the big guys to seek sort of you know, a, a relationship with your advisor. I think that's mm. a great thing, right? I, yeah. I got no problem. Well, I think I think that's good for the industry, and that will, you know. Yeah. Well, yeah. That, no. Yeah, look, that, the more the more attention is um, put on the relationship between the client and the advisor is um, is yeah is excellent. That's definitely the way that uh, the industry is moving. But um, mate, UK. Right, yeah. so, yeah, so back to the UK. We, we yeah, went a yeah. bit of peace there, didn't we? Really? Uh, that, that's okay. That's <laughs> it. it happens. It happens. Um, t- talk to us about something that's not very well understood, and this is QROPS. Now, this I'll give you my uh, my high level understanding. Uh, QROPS, uh, being that it comes from England, stands for um, the Queen's Royal Operating. Uh, uh, procedure is, it, is is that even remotely close? That's right, you got it. Yeah, in one you, you, bazinga. You, you, can, you can take over, take the rest now. <laughs> Adrian, <laughs> <laughs> welcome, hey, to, man. welcome Everything... to the podcast, Adrian. <laughs> <laughs> Everything's royal in England. <laughs> the Queen's royal. Okay, what does what does Kirop stand for? <laughs> I, it, technically, QOPS doesn't exist anymore. It's now ROPS, but it's oh. Qualifying Registered Overseas Pension Scheme. Right. Uh, right. is what it means. And the nuts and bolts of it, we don't need to get into all, all the technical details, but the nuts and bolts of it is HMRC, which is the Inland Revenue in the UK, which is the equivalent of the ATO, will effectively uh, um, allow you to move your pension into a du- jurisdiction if you move to that jurisdiction, as long as the rules in that jurisdiction match the rules in the UK with regards to access to that pension. Yep. Okay? And that's the general sort of gist of, of how it works. One of the... Uh, um, so one of the big things that... And that used to... Yeah, that worked for ages in for Australia just, just fine. One of the big problems uh, came a few couple of years ago where basically HMRC realised that under Australian superannuation law, you can access your pension before the age of 55 in the case of financial hardship, right? That put a spanner in the works because we don't have that or that clause doesn't exist in the UK. So HMRC basically overnight removed all the cure-ups that were listed in Australia. Oh, God. And they all got got removed and and lost their, (coughs) yeah, license or whatever you you want to call it. Mm. Uh, um, So the... Issue with that, and it has been tightened up a lot since then, right? And the background issue, the reason why is HMRC is very scared about uh, um, people having early access and breaking into their retirement pot, right? Well, I think that's sort of... Why? Why? Yeah. Because people will go buy Lamborghinis with it because they're idiots. <laughs> right? No, no, you know, sorry, sorry. Yeah. But, so, but, but yeah, technically... It, it is a retirement pot. It's, uh, the, purpose, <laughs> yeah, the purpose of it is... is you so, know, like Australian superannuation for right, right, right. So that it, it's not like all the money is invested in uh, government infrastructure no, or something. Oh, no, okay, no, okay, no, okay, no, okay. no, no, no. It's just a, just a you know the concept of a, of a, of a retirement pot and and yes, okay. you know, effectively, yeah, making people less reliant on the state. I suppose is the oh no, I think long, you, you long term s- long term thing. You summed it up nicely before. Uh, They're uh, idiots that want to buy Lamborghinis. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> um, so yeah, so now you've got an issue because you can't you can't get uh, um, UK pensions into Australia till after the age of fifty five now, right? Uh, um, you can get them into SMSFs. There, there's a couple of other super funds that I, I know you can do as well, but not until after the age of fifty five. Um, so you need to have a different solution before the age of fifty five because imagine you and a lot of people I think move back in there 
shall we say, mid thirties, they uh, later thirties, they've been uh, earning good money for a period of time. They saved up a decent, uh, uh, yeah, a decent amount in their retirement pot. They've moved back for family reasons, um, and that money has to be left in the UK system now, which is pound sterling. I don't know if you follow much what's going on in the UK, but pound sterling is probably not the best place to be. It hasn't been for a little while with Brexit and all that sort of dramas going on. Mm. Um, and your UK-focused investments, right, as, as the Australian superannuation system is for Australian-focused investments. So like a so, like a 50% exposure generally? Uh, yeah, at least. At least? Uh, yeah, at least. At wow. Least, at least. So you're in, you know, you're in pound sterling and you're in UK-focused investments and you might be there for 20 years plus. But don't so they have the prob- choice that's available like, like on platforms over here? Or? No, so in the pension system over there, Invariably, uh, um, you don't really. You, you can choose what risk profile or what risk category you might be. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, conservative, balanced, aggressive. Well, yeah, you can choose choose one of the, one of those. Um, but underlying, you won't really get to choose the investments or, or, or anything. You can uh, move into a SIP, a self invested pension scheme. Yep. Oh, self invested personal pension. Sorry. Uh, um, the it's not really self invested in the UK, right? Because you can't be your own trustee well over, over here you can be an individual trustee or corporate trustee of an smsf is it more like a wrap is that sort of like a wrap over no, here? Uh, yeah it, you have a professional trustee okay like who dictates what can and can't be invested yeah on but most of the sip trustees will only deal via an advisor anyway mm, so sure. that way you can have some flexibility about what you invest in but it's l- much less flexible than say an smsf Right. Yep. And SMSF is, you know, you have a lot more. Input. So it's almost like having a, like an approved products list they've got yeah, over there. Correct, correct. So but that's the best way. There, I mean, there are, yeah, things that have got to be a, what's registered, called a standard investment, but, you know, we don't need to go into all, all the details and regulations there. But, um, yeah, that's the basic principle. It's like an APL. So you, could you get there. direct shares in it or? Um, yes, you can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. There's no, you, you could do via your. Just like not your own artwork. Like it's like not really that. into. Doesn't let you have your own artwork. <laughs> no, 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 definitely not. Artwork. I mean, no, like uh, investment. Like, yeah, like yeah, 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 uh, um, yeah. There's, it, it, yeah, it's just it is, it is more restrictive. But so, um, yeah, and that's the the situation now. Uh, uh, um, uh, yeah, well, there are solutions around that. There are solutions where you can have Australian dollars. Uh, um, you can invest in Australian dollars, and you can invest in a, a load of. Australian funds and, and uh, um, you know, things for the 20 years you're over here. So at least you can have it in appropriate investments and then move it over here mm. later on. Okay, just just go back go back on that for a second. So quite limited, you got your SIPs and you got your normal super funds over in the UK, which is mostly tailored towards UK investments. Then over the age of 55... You can roll it into a SMSF, or there's a couple of product solutions. Yeah, so it's not just quite something. You can't just roll it into an SMSF. Uh, right. um, you have to uh, the various different things. You have to register that SMSF queue up status. That means you have to do. You've got ten years of reporting once the money's moved into that SMSF. So you have to report to HMRC. Look, it's an area you need some specialist help on because I've already spoken to some people and ex wives done things and yes were shall we say going down the wrong yes avenue. yeah there are some basic things like really don't contaminate your your cure ops and your non cure ops right that's a bit of a disaster so so if one was uh, um, now of course this isn't advice but if yeah. someone was to roll over uh money from a cure ops into a self-managed super fund what you're saying is well you have to register that Self-managed super fund as a QOPS in and the just, first place, which and then, is special deeds and all the rest of it. And but don't put any Aussie assets in there. Um, look, at least keep them segregated within there as a minimum. Again, I won't, yeah, we're not no advice, advice here, no here, advice. Here, but this is definitely put it, not put advice. Put it, put it like this. If you get audited at yes. some point in the next 10 years, yep. how are you going to prove which assets are UK, UK so like which assets are non-UK, right? And how, because you can potentially get fined on the whole pot. Yeah, right, but who's okay. who's who's going to fine you? HMRC. And they can 
fine you from the UK. Correct. And the ATO would allow that to you've happen. You've got 10 years of... The ATO would let that happen? Yes. Wow. Is the R in yeah, that? Yeah, because it's, that... it, it's still considered until the reporting period is over. Yep. You're, you're still considered as... In, I'm surprised in, the ATO would as, let that as happen. As you're in the process, effectively, yeah. of making that transaction, right? Mm, so wow. the fact is that transaction kind of happens, takes 10 years. That's a pretty big deal. So it's a pretty big deal. So what happens yeah. if someone listening, even years from now, right, and they've, and they've buggered it up, they've put the assets together and they've got five years to go, is there anything that they can do? Is there, a, is there an escape Look, parachute emergency? Ultimately... The chances, as long as you're not being thing, you yes. have to report um, significant payments and everything to H- HMRC. So as yes. long as you know the money's sitting there, that the chances of being audited are probably fairly slim. I understand. Right? The yes. consequences of being audited are uh, fairly quite high. high. Yes, right, so it's just one of those. So if, you, if you've made a mistake, you're going to have to go back to your accountant and say, look, that we're going to well, have to unwind what happened yeah, there. Yeah, then you're going to have to get the whole thing audited properly and find out how yeah, much okay. this is, how much that is. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, it, fair it, enough. It, 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 it'll it, be a headache. A, 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 a and then you're going to have sure. to justify it all. Yes. Instead of just being able to say, right, here's, here's the accounts. This is what yep. we did. This is, oh, no, mate, this it's is how we did it. Nice and clean, nice and simple. Can't very, very, yeah. very good information. Um now, is there anything else in between? Now, I know you personally have been working on a product for the last about as long as I've been working on a yeah, goddamn. Uh, take some time, doesn't it? Oh yeah, my it god! Take some time. Oh my goodness! Oh my goodness! And and in your product, you are and because this is very interesting, you've or you're attempting to solve the issue between. Um, we have solved. Okay, excellent, <laughs> excellent. So you have solved the issue between QROPS. Which can't well, so come to have, Australia, yeah, so and but under age fifty-five. Yeah. So we, and made, how do you do that? So, first? so we've done a um, joint venture with a f- fairly large uh, UK group, well, fairly large by Australian standards, uh, we should purpose to say. But um, the FCA, an FCA regulated platform. And what is an FCA regulated financial platform? conduct authority (ASIC) in the UK? Right. Okay. And so this platform. Which is available multiple SIPs and QRP trustees and and things um, will can hold Australian dollars. Yes, and in it has a load of uh, Australian investments, Australian funds, Australian thing, yeah, solutions. Uh, so even though if you're in the UK, you can't invest in Australian things. You've got this weird hybrid where so you, you're allowed to use. So, yeah, so, QROPs so, in Australian dollars to invest in Australian yeah, things. So the money can't technically leave the UK and doesn't technically leave the UK. It right. goes into a UK platform yep. that then can invest into Australian funds and Australian solutions and Australian investments and hold Australian dollars. Right. Now that sounds remarkably simple, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but no, it not, doesn't. It's not. It, no. it's, it's a, uh, one of the things you have to remember is nothing in the UK... Uh, integrates with anything in Australia, right? right? Yeah, they, you, you know, just you can't get anything to integrate. So it's yes. So it's yeah. So it's taken uh, nearly coming on for eighteen odd months since we uh, and there's, realized. And there's nothing like just uh, waking up in the middle of the night and stepping on as many bits of sharp pieces of Lego as possible, right? Just for every day for eighteen months, just because I know yeah. I, I know what it's like. It yeah. is it is it is it's it's hell underwater um, doing startup stuff. Now, Le- yeah. what what I was going to say is um, you've got. I, I'd, I'd actually really appreciate to learn your process. So where did this idea come from, and then how did you go about achieving it? I'm always interested to ask those questions. Um, well, the idea came from very simple is uh, providing solutions to problems, right? Of course. Um, if you're going to try and distribute things or distribute products or distribute, you know, or provide services, or the, you're competing with a lot of other people. If you're just providing a service, yes. you're competing with a lot of other people providing that service. Yes. Right? Uh, um, so it's trying to find solutions for problems, which is uh, I'm a big believer in, yep. which kind of fits in with that, with the finding your niche. Mm-hmm. Podcast yep. from a, a while ago. Yep. Um, but it's really focusing in in on how you can provide, uh, especially as a smaller player in the market. I think it's fair to say how you can s- provide solutions for that for that yes. problem. Um, and 
really this rule change only came about sort of two and a half years ago. Yep. And so, you know, it was, it was a bit of a brainstorm over a, f- a little while of how we could solve. Yeah. Yeah, this particular. And this, this particular is this isn't your first foray into financial services, right? So if we go back to, uh, it was the island of Jersey, was it? We, which which dodgy little Cayman <laughs> Islands country <laughs> did you have your last hedge fund on? <laughs> um, Malta. 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 Ah, I love this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, uh, uh, look, so much more legit. Yeah. <laughs> um, sunnier. <laughs> <laughs> nice sailing boats there. Yeah, they're very nice sailing boats there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't, <laughs> the wind's not doesn't really come up yeah, too much, yeah. but and, and nor does the tax. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's why. That's why Paddy being half Maltese, he loves it there. <laughs> yeah. That's a great spot. Lovely weather. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah no, so, so it's not my first. Uh, we, we had a hedge fund uh, um, as as well. I mean, it, when I was a planner, I, I joined this uh, a group, um, yeah, fairly early on. And effectively, I'd been there, I don't know, six weeks, something like that. I think I'd had one paycheck. And uh, I got taken to the pub and, and basically told that the group, the team that I was had joined, uh, um, were leaving, right, to, to go and do their own their own thing. And they wanted to take, um, so there's six sort of senior guys, and they wanted to take five of the juniors, of which I was one, with them. And I was like, uh, 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 yeah, great. I've only had my first job for, well, not first job, but yeah, first serious position for like six weeks, and now it's disappearing effectively. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, the way it was put to me is, uh, we can't afford to pay you anything to start with, but you'll get paid on what you do. So effectively, it's commission basis uh, 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 solely now. And you know, if it goes really well, profit. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, it will work out much better. If it doesn't go well, well, tough. <laughs> uh, um, so. Yeah, yeah, it was a little bit of a gamble, but uh, I, I, I knew what these guys had done in the past, so uh, I decided to go for it. And uh, luckily, I had well, part of that. I had sort of front row seats of growing a business from eleven of us to a hundred and something of plus advisors in sort wow. of six years. So it was a great learning process. Uh, um, uh, I've actually got a bit of a, well, a stats background, uh, um, and I wanted to get more into the sort of money management side of things investment uh, yeah investment yeah. management and i thought we could bring this in house and i thought we could do it way better than it was being done at the time um they disagreed they, they, <laughs> they, they, yeah we weren't in, we weren't people weren't charging on funds back then and weren't yeah yeah it was as i say selling products basically right. they were, yeah there wasn't any uh sustainable income streams or anything anything like that um so we were giving this away to a yeah a bigger fund management group and just forgetting about it really wasn't being monetized at all it's crazy when you think about it now uh, um so effectively things came to a head uh, uh, we partly wanted to start looking at moving back here or cecilia did uh, i wanted to get into that that side of the business i'd been running some money for myself for, for quite a while and i'd built various sort of quant uh, um yeah automated trading programs to to do that oh nice and that uh, direct shares or futures direct or? shares yeah I, I stay in direct shares automated basically. trading when was this oh 2006 2005 yeah, probably right. started. Um, I, think I, that, I think i got my first email around that time <laughs> <laughs> um yeah, so th- and that was uh, so I went into yeah, we came to an agreement uh, and yeah that they uh, buy out there and I went and decided to rather like you go and do my my own fund and launch that and get that going just before the GFC perfect <laughs> that was, that was great, great work great timing uh, um, yeah. what did you what did what was the name of the fund oh you don't have to share but was it like you know the rise of the phoenix or something. Well, it should be now because it is back. Hello. <laughs> it was Harborside Capital then as well. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, but it fantastic. was a Maltese yes. company, but the, uh, wow. the Stitzy version. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So <laughs> look, look we out. weren't we weren't open for very long because uh, effectively what happened is, and this is one thing I would share with people who are still listening, maybe. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> 
like always but if you're running your own stuff the consequences of of uh, uh, yeah unexpected regulatory change can be huge yeah right so always and i'm a great worker if we get into things we talk about tail risk and all the rest of it right you've got to think as a business owner what is your tail risk all the time mm. what is what is going to shut you down what is going to be what is going to call you well, what's going to cause you to have a a, 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 a a you know a loss that you can't what's your royal commission from? Right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what is your taxi plate? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> your Uber? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Things like that. What's your yeah, what's your Uber moment or what's your yeah, all, all, all the rest of it. Uh, um I was thinking about Nokia phones the other day, having a conversation about Nokia phones, right? And who would have said in 2005, 2006, everyone had a bloody Nokia Absolutely. phone, right? They were the oh, only Snake phone was the best had, thing. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, um, so you've got to be thinking about that all, all, all the time. Uh, and the GFC came around. It caused a lot of, you know, uh, you know uh, losses for, for, for all sorts of, uh, of people. And the regulators were playing catch-up at, at the time. Uh, and they came across with a, a white paper, which isn't even a an actual l- law change or anything. It's just... We're looking at these things, and this is what we considered. Uh, um, and basically, in the white paper, it said that uh, uh, anyone was in an uh, uh, anything that was offshore was going to be considered an unregulated collected investment scheme, UKIS, as opposed to UCITS, because that's the regulated one. It's just like, well, well call it something different. Uh, um, <laughs> and effectively, from that moment. All the PI insurers went. You can't can't invest into those structures. So we were getting money from the our, our networks, and those networks could no longer in, in, invest there. And if you're a new funder, you can't take money in. Uh, it's tough yards, right? Uh, <laughs> we stayed open for about another three three months, and it was just like, well, you know, eighteen months later, they went back on the white paper, and the white paper was changed instruction and things. Oh and never really no. Liked, but, uh, you know, you can't when when you've got overheads and when you've got things you can't, uh, and when you've got no income because you can't raise the funds. Yeah. Uh, um, you got you got to close down, right? And that, that was probably a. Uh, uh, so that was a lesson in yeah unintended consequence of regulatory change. You've done nothing wrong yourself, but you're you're out of business and it's cost you a packet. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, and that was uh, so that quickly burnt through. A good deal of the, all those, the money, all the bonuses the, the from the commission. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Um, and then uh, effectively moved. Uh, well, I was based in Australia by then, anyway. Um, so I did my own thing for a, a, a little while, and uh, then I got back into the funds management game a few years ago, uh, um, four or five years ago now. Mainly because uh, uh, some of my introducers from the UK and things and and I'd stayed you know, friends with uh, a lot of the trustees and things from QOPS and, pen- oh, and offshore pension things and uh, the rest of it and you know so they, they were uh, um, yeah, encouraging me to start again which we did under the managed account structure which I way prefer so much so mm-hmm. much easier. The, you prefer managed? Ah uh, for sure for, from fr- compared to funds. Unitized. Compared to managed funds, yes, right, yeah. Look, mainly f- from a business point of view, um, they're a lot more flexible structure, uh, uh, and they're a lot easier to set up uh, uh, and and start. Uh, um, you know, if you get demand for a new uh, get getting a fund off the ground is you know 100k plus uh, plus 100k plus a year to run. Right. Uh, um, you need some decent distribution to be able to cover those cover those costs yes um someone comes to you and says no we 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 want solu- a different kind of solution than your fund you need a new fund right it's just very difficult where's where's M- mdas i mean we run uh like 12 plus strategies now uh, um across various different uh, uh currencies yeah uh, um so you know it allows us to do all those things uh, which it wouldn't do in a, in a funds in, in a, if we are unitized funds, it would just be too expensive for like yeah. So it's way cheaper for us. Well, we can operate at about the same cost pace as one fund, and we can have multiple different investment solutions. So yeah, we can build whatever people need. Yeah, cool. As well, so so yeah, I, I prefer it. Other people would disagree, but that's fine. They can 
They spend dis- the money. They could disagree. Spend the money. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah, so that's what we do now. We're we're a, we're managed account business. Yep. Um, High level. Can you explain managed accounts if someone doesn't know what it is? So managed accounts is basically a, a legal structure whereby the the end client keeps ownership of their assets under their own name or in whatever structure that the, they want, and they appoint a professional manager over those assets who then has to trade uh, or has to operate and invest according to an agreed well, it's now an investment program right but an investment memorandum is kind of what everyone would know it as but let's call it investment program because that's what we've got to call it these days <laughs> uh, um so so an agreed investment program uh, uh, um so you you you, know, you can't operate outside of that program right, right? so so you know uh, and that can be also that can be anything you can think of yeah, right. Just about. And then how do financial planners use it? Or they don't? Or they do? Yeah, yeah, in different ways. Uh, so, so, yeah, obviously, do you mean on managed accounts in general? Because I'm sure that they're... Yes. Or, or, yeah, so, yeah, so, yeah. So, um, you can go direct to managed account providers. Some yep. financial planners I know have MA, uh, MDA on their license. Yes. By the way, others that are operating... MDAs, and I mean making the investment decisions about, and even if they're operating an SMA, there's changes coming up in October. Yeah, let's so talk about that. Their licenses, because we've but, spoken about these changes before. What, what are these? So basically, in, uh, in uh, October, the uh, AS, uh, ASIC uh, no action, uh, um, uh, I don't know what uh, no action opinion is. is really the best way to describe it on managed accounts or MDAs is is changing or, or disappearing uh, in October the 1st which means that after a, a few years of reviewing and consulting and, and all, all the rest of it um, it's what was happening or, or was that advisors were operating on uh, third party platforms yep okay and basically operating their own MDAs yep and getting away with the fact that that plat- doing it through a platform, a third-party license platform, was meaning that they didn't have to have the MDA license and authorizations. <laughs> right. Right. You just used um, the authorization through the platform. Effectively, just using the authorized. That was called, became known as the limited MDA, or more commonly known as the limited MDA. Mm-hmm. I can't really find much about the limited MDA if you actually look in the actual ASIC. Right. Be like rules, guidelines, yeah, yeah. Guidelines, but but um, so that disappears, ends on October the first. Right. And if you do that, you're now going to need to. You have to be. You have to have it on your license. And how does how does one get it on their license? I have to a variation of their license. So let's say. Uh, so they need to have the relevant, you know, relevant experience in MDAs. So three out of five years, I think they need to have done it, and then apply for that to. to be put onto their license and if someone's a part of a, a large license then they need to go to their license and say hey I, I, I need to have this ability on my license and then they might say go do a course at kaplan or whatever yeah <coughs> like yeah i guess so i don't know the the workings of how it work on an individual right license point of view but after october you know you, you just, things change and you need to look into yeah, it exactly exactly and, and so go and speak to your compliance people or right <laughs> Go and speak to somebody also that knows about MDAs, right? Uh, there's a lot of yeah, very good compliance people out, out there, obviously, and and the consultants and things. But I think there's a lot that aren't experienced in MDAs. Yes. And if they're not experienced in MDAs, yes. I, like, I've come across some things when I've been to, oh, you know, I've spoken to my, and he said this, and you just said, uh, I've just sent them back a, a link to. The ASIC guidelines, yeah, to, to, to the to the appropriate <laughs> ASIC guidelines. I said, Look, you read it and make your own interpretation, right? Yeah, yeah, it's pretty black and white, you know. <laughs> it's yeah, like, yeah, yeah. So, so, yeah. Okay, so for for the advisors out there that aren't doing it themselves, then there are a range of different options. I think Macquarie does one. I think there's a few. Uh, Harborside Capital does one. I think, and so there's a, there's multiple yeah. providers out there that do yeah, this. There's multiple. There's multiple. But, and what kind of costs are we looking at here? And so let, let, let's say, for example, I'm using Macquarie Wrap or North Wrap or Hub24 or bloody whatever you want, right? Oh, look, the it, costs, yeah, the wrap costs are, yeah, and the investment costs are, you know, just change uh, on the individual wraps. Like some, some are 
obviously far more than others. Right. So the way that it works is you get your wrap, then an MDA supplier, and then... Yeah, so you don't uh, the assets under there. Yeah, is that yeah. how it works? No, it depends what you do. It depends what you want to do from the bit. And it's, it, like it really does get the the choices uh, um, get very very uh, you know, complex if you if you like. So it really does depend on the individual case of what the individual try advisor wants to achieve. Yep. And how they want to achieve it, right? Yep. Uh, you don't have to be on a platform. You can do, do this off platform. You, you can want. do it off platform yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You and how would you platform. track it digitally then? How would you do reporting? Um, so if you're going to do it, uh, 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 and again, you, you, you know, dep- depends. Uh, yeah, you, you would want to be. Do- you have to do it with somebody, obviously, with the license to do it. Right. How we would do it. Yeah. All reports into ours, so we can do it off. Uh, we, you know, we use interactive brokers and some other right brokers, and that that they report directly into our systems, and we do all the reported on behalf of the on behalf of the advisors and clients and all the, right. all the rest of it, right? Right. So is an um, MDA just sort of like a wrap but without the tech? Yeah, like, yeah. Ah, yeah, yeah, you can interesting. do it. Uh, and it, so it, yeah, it's just, a, it's just a structure. It can fit inside a wrap. It can yep. fit outside. It doesn't have to be in a, in a wrap. Yeah, so right. So if you, you can operate it way cheaper. Like fund. a managed fund. I guess yeah, you can own a managed yeah. fund on and uh, off a wrap. And so right. if, you, if you're doing it off a wrap, right, you can deliver your investment and, and you know, you can deliver your investment to the end client at much cheaper price point. Interesting, but it's probably not going to have it's not going to have all the bells and whistles of a wrap and all the options of a wrap. But if that's what you want, so if you're, for instance, if you're running a pretty passive investment philosophy, yep, okay, and I know it's very popular right now, and yep. we might get onto that in a second because <laughs> I don't believe it even exists. But anyway, that's <laughs> like that's a, yeah, we're going to get a bit left field there. But if you're delivering a, a fairly passive investment philosophy for your client. Why is it on a wrap? Right, right, right. Like there's right. just layers of cost to go into a cheap solution. It doesn't need to be. Well, you need like, to hold. Yeah, as an advisor, you need to have a. Tr- you need to be able to track where your client's money is. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, you need to be able to track where your client's money is, but it doesn't yeah. have to be on a on a. It doesn't have to be on a wrap. Or well, how else there's would you track of, it? There's lots of other MDA providers that are, that are smaller operators that aren't wraps that can do all that for you anyway. But how do you track it if the MDA doesn't have tech? Oh, well, most of them do have tech. So you can get you can see your client accounts through us. I, look, I don't know about everyone else. But sure. You, through us, you can see your client accounts and everything like that. You can log on. You can see right, so an MDA your, structure's even... You get all your reporting. You get all your... Yeah, it's a simplified... It's a simplified wrap. Yeah. All right. Well, to, to, to wrap us up, first of all, um, in, in a, in a one-minute summary, I'd love to hear what your view is of passive investment philosophy, just in one minute. One minute, and, jeez. And then, and then, um, and then we'll, we'll let everyone know where they can find you if they want to reach out and say hi. And discuss passive investment yeah. philosophy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> look, look, pa- passive investing uh, and the whole ETF uh, drive, uh, I think, is a great thing on the cost basis, driving down costs, et cetera, et cetera. That is a, a big uh, restriction or hurdle to returns. No doubt about it. I think you need to consider a lot more uh, about what passive investing actually is um, because it's a rules-based investment approach, right? It's not passive at all, right? Buy and hold is passive, Passive, as we know it, is a, is basically you're rebalancing every quarter. For, for instance, you are let's say uh, at an ASX 200 ETF, you're rebalancing every quarter. You're removing your worst performing, if you if you like, and replacing replacing those. Uh, um, so you know you've got a set of well, it's a, you could argue, and it's a, you know, one minute on it, but you could argue it's a long term momentum play because you're just continually removing your worst performance and uh, mm. performers and adding you know mm-hmm. new ones in that hopefully will do better that is part of the reason you're creating a right hand skew which i get into talking about a lot when, when we're talking about risk and things but that's partly the reason that markets when you look at a market they tend to go up over time well of course they do because you're continually replacing your worst ones with better ones right so but you are following a rules-based investment approach now, some thoughts that, that I'll leave you leave you with, and, uh, and yeah, that, that I think advisors especially really need, do need to think about. Passive, if you're doing it on a market weighted basis, i.e., you're doing your biggest asset allocations to the biggest stock in that market. Okay, I think it's inherently dangerous and suboptimal 
Okay, it works really well in some markets or has for a period of time. Australian market, not so sure about. Uh, I'm not so sure I've been so comfortable with it. Um, and the reason being, if we have a look, compare Australia to the US very, very quickly. In Australia, the top 20 stocks, right? Yeah, or top 10 stocks make up something like 45% of the ASX 200. Right, so you're basically investing in that top 10 stocks. Okay, average age of those companies in the top 10 stocks is, you know, it's the banks, it's the resources. They, they are, some of those have been around for over 100 years, right? It's pretty, pretty up there. Compare that to the US. Okay, look at the top 10, top 20 stocks in the markets in S&P 500 or, or something. A lot of those companies weren't even around 15 years ago. Okay, so no wonder you're allocating your biggest in, in the US, you're allocated your biggest positions to stocks that are growing the fastest or have been growing the fastest. In Australia, you are not. We don't have fast growing stocks. No, no, well, no. We have banks and, and things of the. I'm just saying if you're doing a market weighted approach. Yeah, so you like the all weight. The, um, so all weight would be an improvement. Equal weight. Right? I've got lots of improvements, but equal weighting would well, be. Well, there is one out yeah, there. Yeah, no, no. So, mm-hmm. And Smart Beta, I'm, a, I'm a, a fan of. Oh, okay. Factor investing, I'm a fan of. Okay. Uh, 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 um, you know, that is, a, and that's what we do is, is rules based factor in, investing. Gotcha. That's your we sort would, of quant overlay yeah, on Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's basically what we what we do. And that is, I uh, have gotcha. done it for, for 10 plus years. And that's what we would, that's what I would believe in. But we'd be called active, right? And not passive and what i'm saying is is passive is actually active space is actually <laughs> active to a certain extent anyway yeah. you just need to you know it's all about the rules. the rules yeah the rules are, are underneath so things like um if you if you're talking about uh smart beta approaches which is one of them um momentum qual- quality value you know those factors have got lots of lots of uh, academic research behind them and, and proven factors that generate returns. Mm. If you don't believe you can beat the market, okay, or, or what is a representation of the market, then why do you have smart? Why is smart beta even existed? Why are people? Why are the big ETF movers moving into smart beta? Well, right? It's just like, a more consistent implementation of what would usually rules. be it's just different rules right? well, most like, investment managers yeah. are investment philosophy yeah, yeah, they, they've got yeah. they just but the, so maybe for, aren't as consistent in applying it <laughs> so for instance the the equal weight and i think that's a very good point right that comes into behavioral finance and all mm. that sort of stuff which i would like yeah i think the consistency i think what does it uh, is the consistency of applying the rules right like i, th- I think where active is actually discretionary uh, yeah i think there's problems there Mm. because that brings behavioral issues Mm. in uh, and that is suboptimal for performance right Um, but but you're suggesting yeah equal if if equal weighting outperforms market weighted Mm. okay which generally it does over Mm. a period of time nearly across all markets Mm. Well, that's already one rule that we've just found, well, and we're not the most intelligent people in the room. Well, pretty simple rule in this room, but um, <laughs> well, there is yeah, that that's, a pretty, that's a, there's one pretty simple rule that you just come up with, right? That can beat the market, or you know, or you're pretty comfortable that says gives better returns. You don't what other rules would you suggest? You don't think there's a? Oh, uh, I've got a lot of them, but <laughs> what's, what, okay, all right. Before we go, what, what's your favourite? Factor rule that you'll what's your little you might turn it on and off every now and again, but what, what's no, there's no turning it on, on and off every, every, every now and again. That's oh, so you the, come yeah. up with another one and you just go, Well, well I, th- no, no, I think no, that's the argument. If yeah. you're doing active management, it's not on and off, it's not discretionary. You're suggesting that if r- rules based factors, so we stay right. with our rules, we stay with our so it's very clean. Those are those multiple options, you yeah. Can well, with a very clean investment philosophy and rules based though that we stay so we, yeah we would now call ourselves or we do call ourselves sometimes smarter beta right mm. smarter like that, like that smarter <laughs> beta but i will thank you very much for coming on here mate and uh and, and if someone wants to reach out and say hi how do they find you um best way is uh you know, just send me uh, an email at adam at hscapital.com.au have a look on our website um, info at hscapital.com.au if you don't want to talk to me you want to talk to someone else Twitter I'd draw on Twitter a bit 
I'm on Twitter a little bit. Yeah, 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 yeah like yeah, a little yeah. joke here and there. I'll yeah, see. yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on, yeah, yeah. I need more friends on Twitter. I haven't got many. On <laughs> it's just you, like, just you, me, you yelling just at a me wall. Just me jokes to myself, really. Like, like, uh, it makes, yeah, yeah. Just uh, give it time, man. Can you like? <laughs> can you like your own stuff? <laughs> you can. Clay does it all the time. Right. Thanks. Thanks a lot, mate. Excellent. Thanks, guys. See you.